Hey guys, welcome back to the CS Classroom. This is topic six of the IB Computer Science Curriculum. Um, this material is only really covered on paper one of the HL exam and it is called Resource Management. Now this topic looks more in depth than uh, in topic two at the basic components of a computer, how they work together, um, what their specifications are and what the impact of having less than what you need might be. And more broadly, the role of the operating system because we kind of cover it and the SL curriculum in topic two, but not to this level of depth. First, we're gonna talk about different resources in a computer. Um, so primary memory, secondary storage, processor speed, bandwidth, screen resolution, sound processor, graphics processor, cache, and network connectivity. And we're gonna look at, um, we're gonna look at basically what the roles of these are, um, what their limitations are, and what kind of the typical profile is of these particular components. Again, building off topic two. First one we're going to look at is primary memory. You should know that primary memory um, it basically allows, allows us to store data for currently running programs. In this topic, we're not really looking at ROM, we're actually just looking at RAM, which is random access memory. Now, common capacities are 4, 8, or 16 gig of RAM. If you have a super like high hardcore gaming computer, you might have 32 gigabytes of RAM, but these are generally what you'll see in most computers and laptops nowadays. Now, if we don't have enough primary memory, this means that fewer programs or processes can run simultaneously, and computers must rely on virtual memory, which is much slower. Remember, virtual memory is when we are taking data out of our RAM because it's overloaded, and putting it into our secondary storage, and then bringing it back when we need it. So just basically, if you don't have enough primary memory, then you're not going to be able to do as much stuff, because every time you open a computer or start a process, RAM is required to store the data related to that program, and if you don't have space for the data, then you just can't run the program. So more primary memory is usually a good thing. Now next we have secondary storage. Um, so secondary storage stores all data, including the OS, program files, and multimedia data. It can also be used as virtual memory when RAM is overloaded. We're gonna talk a little bit more about virtual memory and how that works later on in this particular slideshow. Now some common capacities are 500 gigabytes, one terabyte, or two terabytes for a hard disk drive. So that's the one where we have a spinning disk. And for a solid state drive, we're gonna have 256 gig or five, 512 gigabytes. You may see a one terabyte solid state drive, but that's probably gonna be a lot more expensive than a one terabyte hard disk drive. And also, I mean, if we're talking about optical disks, a CD is generally going to be 650 megabytes and a DVD is going to be 4.7 gigabytes, but we don't really use those anymore. And the only reason I included it here was just because um, the IB exam does go back to 2014. So there might be some weird question or scenario where you need to know about optical disks. Now, if we don't have enough secondary storage, um, we're going to have a limited amount of virtual memory. Um, basically, we're going to have a, lim a limited amount of space for RAM to transfer its data uh, to the secondary storage. So that's gonna limit the number of programs or processes we can run. Um, but additionally, this just means that we just don't have as much data as we want. So there's a limited number of programs and files that can be stored and used. So for example, if your hard disk drive is only gonna be you know, 128 gigabytes, you may not be able to store a bunch of movies on your, uh, on your computer or play, um, play games that take up 20 gigabytes. Um, besides virtual memory, I would say any questions related to this particular aspect are pretty much going to be common sense. Uh, next, we have our processor. Now, as you should know, processor handles all calculations and logical operations. So anytime you click on a button and you select, uh, you select a particular um, option in a, in a computer program, um, your decision is going to be sent to RAM. And from RAM, whatever code um, or whatever command that you initiated is going to be sent eventually to the CPU for that to be processed and executed. And that execution is going to be a function of some logical operation that is specified by the code. Now what we didn't learn about is that um, what we didn't learn about in topic two that is is that a processor can contain multiple cores. So if you ever if you ever seen a dual core or a multi-core processor, that's referring to the number of ALUs that are in that particular um, processor. So one processor with multiple ALUs. Now this allows uh, program execution to happen in parallel, which is basically increases the number of operations that can be conducted per second, 
making the computer as a whole much faster. That being said, when we are um, trying to measure processor speed, that's certainly going to be done in gigahertz, which refers to um, the number of FDE cycles or fetch to code execute cycles per second. Remember that one? So one gigahertz is going to be 1 billion FDE cycles. And in general, common processor speeds are 2, 2.4, or 3.2 gigahertz. But you may see some crazy computers with 4 gigahertz or even 5 gigahertz processors. And you're definitely going to pay for that. Now, the effect of limited processor speed is just that all programs run more slowly. But in particular, uh, those programs that make uh, heavy use of the processor, such as games, video editors, and graphic design software, which involve a great deal of mathematical calculations for every action that's taken, will definitely run more slowly or just not be able to run at all. Now, we can compare uh, single core and multi core processors. Now, if we have a single core processor, processor, all commands are going to be done sequentially, so one after the other, versus multi core, we can have commands being run at the same time. A multi core processor is going to require more electricity, it's going to be faster, it's going to be more efficient. And as we kind of said before, allows for multitasking. So basically, if we're looking down here at this diagram for dual core and quad core processors, we might have these applications that can run on a, on a dual core processor, but the same, but the equivalent processor with the same speed, but um, but with four ALUs, meaning quad core, can run just more applications at the same time. And right here in this diagram, we can highlight the difference between the sequential operations of a single core processor and the parallel operations of a dual core processor. So right here, we've got a full package for you to kind of understand what the difference is between single core and multi-core processors and how more cores can make a difference in the operations of a CPU. Now next, a resource that we're dealing with when we're working with computers is bandwidth. So bandwidth is how much data can be sent at the same time in a given time frame. And we're talking about this in terms of a network. So when computers are networked together, how much data could be sent from one computer to the other computer at the same time in a given time frame? Now, common network speeds um, are 100 megabits per second, or um, nowadays you can even get, particularly if we're talking about uh, internet connectivity, we can have one gigabit per second of data that's being transferred to ES across the internet to an ISP. Generally, when we're talking about speeds or network speeds, they're expressed in megabits or gigabits per second. Um, this shouldn't be confused with megabytes and gigabytes. So when we're talking about one megabit per second, um, we're talking about we're really talking about 12.5 megabytes per second. And the reason for that is because one byte is eight bits. So to go from megabits to megabytes, we would have to divide however many megabits we have by eight to get the speed in terms of megabytes or gigabytes. Now, a typical broadband connection it's going to be 16 to 100 megabits per second, and a local area and a local area network connection, um, or I mean another local area local area network connection could also be one gigabit per second. Um, I will say that these speeds we don't normally talk about speeds of just networks. Usually we're talking about speeds um, of data transfer uh, from the internet to our own um, to our own modem um, or to our own household. And I mean I guess this is still kind of logical because the internet the internet itself is a network. Now, if we have limited bandwidth, we're going to have slow data transfer across networks. If we're accessing the internet through a network, the internet speeds will be slower. Um, just generally, we're not going to be able to transfer data as fast as maybe we would like. So if you have low bandwidth, I mean, this is actually, I feel like this is kind of common sense. Um, you know, the higher the bandwidth is, the more data we can transfer in the same amount of time. So the next resource we're going to talk about is screen resolution. I guess it's technically not a research, but it's an, ex it's an aspect of working with computers. Um, so the screen resolution represents the number of pixels that can be shown horizontally and vertically. So here's an example of a screen resolution. This repre represents a screen that has 1,024 pixels, uh, a width of 1,024 1, pixels, and a height of 768 pixels. This is a fairly low resolution screen. What you're probably more used to is uh, a screen with 4K resolution, which is essentially um, 4,096 pixels across and width. 2,304 pixels in height. Now here's some here's some more um, representations of common screen resolutions. Now, generally the effect of a limited or lower screen resolution is that images and videos are pixelated and don't appear in as high quality as normal. Now obviously this represents on the resolution of the images or videos in question as well. 
Um, if you have a video that's been shot on like a phone camera from 10 years ago, it's probably not going to matter. But if you shot a video on your newest uh, 4K camera and you try to play that on a screen with a resolution of 1024 by 768, it's probably not going to look that good. Now, the file size of that particular video may be lower, um, or the file size of a video that's been shot in a very poor or, or cheap camera might be lower, but the quality as well that you see is going to be much lower. So basically, just to summarize, uh, this is you know, screen, screen resolution is a measurement of how many pixels there are on the screen. And in order for you to be able to see images and videos in the highest quality, those images and videos are going to have to be shot using a, a good camera. But also equally, you're going to need a, uh, a screen with a relatively high resolution, perhaps 4K, um, in order to be able to display it uh, to its fullest quality. Here's an example of a image displayed on a, on a low resolution screen and that same image on a high resolution screen. Notice the difference, it should be pretty obvious. Um, the next, I guess not necessarily resource again, the next component we're gonna talk about is going to be a sound processor. Now, when we're talking about a sound processor, we are generally talking about a, more or more, more so talking about a sound card that is a particular module on your computer that's connected to a motherboard um, that is responsible for dealing with all audio related operations. So specifically, it's going to be translating analog audio signals to digital signals and digital signals to analog audio signals. So basically allowing a microphone and a speaker to function. Um, and as part of allowing a speaker to function, it may process or pre-process those audio files to produce the highest quality sound possible through your speakers. Now, generally the sound card, which again is, can be synonymous with the sound processor, will have its own processing unit um, and may even have memory on it. And basically the point is that instead of the main CPU uh, dealing with audio related operations, those operations instead get sent to the sound processor, which then can deal with them, thereby taking a load off the CPU. Now, sound processors or sound cards are normally used in computers, home theater systems, and phones. So the effect of a limited sound processing capability, so having a sound processor that, processor that is either very low powered or just doesn't exist, is low quality, low quality audio output because you don't have anything processing audio or enhancing it before outputting it to speakers. Uh, but also your overall CPU capacity is gonna be lower because now those tasks that would have been sent to a sound processor are being sent to your CPU and that's slowing it down, taking away, um, taking away time and resources from the CPU that could otherwise be devoted to general system operations. And as a result, those audio related operations are also longer because they also take longer because they need to wait their turn to be executed by the CPU. Next off, we've got the cache. Now, this should be very familiar to you. Uh, the cache sits between the CPU and the RAM and contains instructions most frequently requested by the CPU from the RAM. And it speeds up CPU operations. And by that, I mean that gigahertz value that we talked about previously. So basically more FD cycles can be done per second if we have a cache. Now, cache sizes can vary depending on the type of cache. You can have eight megabytes, 16 megabytes, 32 megabytes, that should be a B. Um, and general, gen, generally, you'll have a certain amount of cache attached to each core. So for example, if you have a quad core processor, you're going to have some memory attached to each of those cores. Now, if you have a limited cache size or just non-existent cache, of course, the CPU must wait longer to receive instructions from the RAM. And that means that CPU operations in general are going to be slower. Now, next off, we've got the graphics processor. In a computer, we will be referring to a graphics card. And a graphics card in a computer generally contains what's called a GPU, or a graphical processing unit and memory to handle all graphical operations. Now, the graphical processing unit is very similar to a CPU, but it is structured in a different way um, and is optimized for rendering images to your display. The role of a graphics card is to take images that are generated by software and display them on your computer screen. And a GPU, as well as a graphics processor in general, are optimized for this particular functionality. Part of this includes the ability to conduct operations in parallel. Now, graphical operations are an order of magnitude more mathematically intensive than those required for the general oper operations of a computer. And the GPU structure reflects this. Now, if you have a limited graphics card capability, those graphical operations are shifted to the CPU, significantly slowing it down and can lead to reduced graphics quality because also 
there just isn't the computing, there isn't the level of computing resources necessary to produce um, a more high resolution or a better quality graphic. Um, now, here's some comparisons between a CPU and a GPU. I think the best takeaway from this is that while a GPU can appear faster than a CPU, a GPU is really good at what it does and a CPU is really good at what it does. Um, now, for just looking at this diagram, with a, with a GPU, we're going to have, we could have thousands of cores all operating in parallel versus in a CPU, we're going to have multiple cores but operating sequentially, or more sequentially at least. So one is not necessarily better than the other, but both of these are specialized at their given task. Now next, let's talk about network connectivity. So when we're talking about network connectivity, so in, in a previous slide, we were talking about bandwidth, right? Now this is different. Here referring for referring to the ability of our device or computer to connect to a network. And there are a variety of ways that can happen. Um, it could be through a network interface card, which is um, something that's attached to our motherboard and our computer. It allows us to connect an ethernet cord to our computer. We could have a wireless network interface card, which allows our computer to connect to wireless networks. Now these used to be something you had to install into a computer. Nowadays, these are, all, these are basically installed by default in almost every device we have. So a laptop, a phone, a computer will all have these integrated. Um, but this, there is in fact a device called a WNIC or a wireless network interface card that is necessary to connect to wireless networks regardless of whether we know it's there or not. Again, um, another way is by Bluetooth. We might have a chip that allows us to communicate via, via Bluetooth signals with a network, a Bluetooth network. And also um, we can access networks using cellular radio waves, using cellular networks. Uh, via 3G, 4G, or 5G, and we may have a chip again in our device that enables this. Now, the effects of limited network connectivity throughout through any of these possible network uh, interface network interface devices, cards, chips, is that access to other computers over networks may be very slow or impossible. Um, if a network is internet enabled, and we have um, some form of network connectivity that is very slow or limited, then internet access can be very slow. Now this is an example of a NIC that will allow us to connect to an ethernet port or connect to our computer. Um, this is kind of like a bit hardcore. I mean, this is what we would use maybe to connect a desktop computer to Wi-Fi. But again, like you don't see something like this in your MacBook. So you're gonna have something that's more integrated that perhaps looks a bit more like this. Although this itself allows us to connect to 3G, 4G or 5G networks. This is a chip that exists in everyone's phone that allows us to connect to those networks, those cellular uh, networks. And right here, this is a Bluetooth chip. So this is something that we would have to use in order to connect to a Bluetooth network or any sort of other device over Bluetooth. Now, um, we're kind of shifting uh, gears here. As part of this particular uh, topic, you need to know, you need to be able to identify a number of different types of computers or computing devices. Now, most of them are pretty straightforward. Um, I mean, some of them include like cell phones and computers and stuff that I really shouldn't have to explain. But there are two that are less well known that I am going to go into, and those are mainframes and server farms. Now, starting with mainframes, a mainframe mainframe is just one huge computer um, with many, many multi-core pro multi processors, a ton of RAM, and a bunch of petabytes of secondary storage. So just think about your own uh, desktop PC at home or one that may exist in school. Just multiply that by 100, and you've got a mainframe computer. Now, these are generally used for large-scale business tasks that require you to keep track of and process a lot of data. Some examples include airline reservation systems, payroll processing to pay out your employees, and predicting weather or predicting, uh, or predicting financial stuff. So predicting the financial future, for example, which is very processor intensive and may require a lot of RAM because there's a lot of data that needs to be processed. So here's an example of a mainframe computer. Now, some interesting facts about mainframe computers that kind of give you an idea of, of what their role is. They're used by banks, retailers, insurers. They handle 90% of all credit card transactions. Um, basically, without mainframe computers, most of what we use or most of what we use to pay for things wouldn't work. Now, on the other hand, we have server farms, which are in some ways similar in their scope. But rather than just being one computer, um, server farms are many computers that are connected and working in parallel to complete some common task. Now, each computer could have multiple processors, terabytes of secondary storage, 
and 16 gigabytes of RAM. Um, but generally, like each server in a server farm would probably be more similar to your home computer, except on steroids, probably. Um, but the big difference being that it's not just one, but it's hundreds or thousands that, that are all connected to give you um, a similar higher level of performance than a mainframe computer. Now, oftentimes, um, we, these are used in data centers for cloud hosting, for scientific simulations, and for 3D, re 3D rendering. Now, some of the reasons why you might use a server farm over a uh, mainframe are if you want a certain level of redundancy. Now, with your mainframe computer, if there is a cyber attack or um, there's some sort of external factor affecting the computer, the whole thing goes down. With the data center, you may only lose a couple of computers. Um, or you may be able to shut off a certain number of computers to isolate the data center as a whole from whatever threat there is, from whatever external threat there is. The same thing with a cloud hosting system. Um, additionally, sometimes server farms just are just created out of necessity. So you may need to do a very graphically intensive task or very computing resource intensive task like 3D rendering, but you don't have access to a mainframe computer. So you just get every computer that you can get your hands on, put them together, kind of daisy link or chain them up to be able to, to complete a more difficult task. So now our next section. So I mean, so far we basically covered uh, computing resources, um, like just basically gone in depth with the uh, types of components you're using in a computer and talked about two separate types of computers. Um, now let's go ahead and talk about operating systems and get more in depth with what operating systems do. So we're going to go in detail into the different roles of an operating system. We kind of covered this again in topic two, but we're going to go into more detail here. So these are the roles that we're going to cover. Uh, let's get started. So the first way in which uh, operating systems play a role is with peripherals. Now, per peripherals are devices that can be connected to a computer, but are not essential. So a mouse, keyboard, speakers, and printer can all be connected to a computer. But if you took all of those away, you might not be able to do much, but the computer would still work. Now, the OS in general will, will provide drivers. And drivers are software programs that translate the signal from the peripheral into digital data that can be interpreted by a computer. Now, I mean, some of these peripherals might actually produce their own digital data, but drivers are still necessary to take that data or that signal from whatever peripheral you have and then turn it into something that can be used by the operating system um, and by the computer in general. Now, the majority of drivers are included as part of the OS. Um, in many cases, that is a role of the OS, but they can also be installed, although that's less and less common nowadays. Now, the next role is memory management. So the operating system ensures that each program is, alloc is allocated or allotted its own chunk of, uh, of space in the RAM. So basically, remember how we talked about how RAM is organized in terms of, memory, uh, in terms of memory addresses in hex and then data attached to each of those memory addresses? Um, so basically, the OS will, for any given program, will allocate a set of memory addresses for the operations of that given program, which is known as the memory space. Um, now, the OS also ensures that these programs only use the space that have been allocated and don't access or modify the memory space of other programs. So basically, make sure that they're operating separately from each other and not interfering with each other. The OS also manages the virtual memory feature. So remember, when we're talking about virtual memory, we're talking about transferring data from the RAM when it gets overloaded to the secondary storage. Now, this data that's transferred from uh, the RAM to secondary storage it's transformed in the form of pages. So, the, so this data is divided into what are called pages. Basically how it works is, well, I mean, we basically just described how it works, but once it's transferred to secondary storage, um, it's basically there until some space in RAM is free, and then it's gonna be sent back to the RAM. Now, this process of sending pages of data to the secondary storage and then sending that data back is generally called paging, also known as swapping. So again, as we said, um, as soon as there's empty space in the RAM, data will be transferred back. Now, swapping is controlled, this whole process, this sort of orchestra of transferring data back and forth between the RAM and the secondary storage is orchestrated by a computer's memory management unit, which isn't specifically part of the OS, but will have a relationship to the OS. Um, the MMU will use any number of algorithms to choose what pages to be swat, swapped back to the RAM. Least recently used, least frequently used, most recently, most recently used. So for example, um, if all of a sudden we have 
if we have been swapping data to our secondary storage, and all of a sudden now we have free um, we have free space in our RAM, we'll either transfer the oldest piece of data, we'll either transfer the oldest piece of data in our virtual memory or our secondary storage um, back to the RAM, the least frequently used piece of data, or the most recently used data, so the one that we just put in there. So you don't necessarily need to know what these are. These are just kind of examples, but you just need to know that the MMU will swap data back and forth um, using some algorithm or the other, some scheme. Now, there's one larger file in the secondary storage that contains all the pages that have been swapped there, and this is called the page file or the swap file. This is a handy diagram. Now, you know, the CPU is controlling the memory management unit. Um, the OS may also pay, play a role in its initiation. Um, but really right here, I would say that this is a largely CPU and computer driven operation um, with the RAM, be, with data from the RAM being transferred to the hard disk and vice versa. Now in secondary storage itself, um, our OS helps us structure data and to be able to find this data. Now, if you've used any Windows computer, you've seen this sort of folder or directory structure. That's something that the OS does. The OS will also manage uh, security of each of these folders, controlling access based on the user. Uh, the next role of the OS is to um, basically create or display a user interface. Now, this may be a command line interface or a CLI or a graphical user interface. Graphical user interface is what you see in my computer right now, which we can click on. And the command line interface is something you are more likely to see in a terminal or a command prompt. Now, the user interface broadly allows users to give commands to the computer and can translate any input or output via the, the oh, and rather, sorry, the operating system can translate any input or output via the, the user interface and send it to or from the correct mem memory address for execution. That process of sending it to the memory address and eventually the CPU um, basically being what's going on when we try to give a command to a computer or try to receive some information after we've given a command to the computer. So the point is, you can control a computer, and then you can you can and then you can see the output of whatever command you gave it through the user interface. Um, so you can do that through a GUI or CLI. If you do do it through a GUI, through a graphical user interface, then you've got a GUI-based operating system. If it's through a CLI, then you'll have a CLI-based operating system. Here's a fun little comic. Unix can be kind of hard to use sometimes. Now, the next operation of an OS is time slicing. So a time slice is the set amount of processing time a particular program or user is allotted for CPU usage. So this means that each user or program might be allocated a certain amount of time. Uh, that amount of time can really vary, but allocating this time, to, this processing time, this time during which a program or user can utilize a CPU is a function of the OS. And each slice of time that is allocated by the OS is called a time slice. Um, these time slices, or these these amount, these basically units of processing time uh, for each program or for each uh, program operation, um, are scheduled for execution by the scheduled program. So the OS is going to say, "Okay, you just type something into Microsoft Word." Uh, to actually store that in the computer is going to take maybe like one millisecond, or actually probably a lot less than that. So that's a time slice, and we're going to schedule when that command is going to get executed through the scheduler program, which is part of the OS. Now, one program will obviously have multiple tasks and multiple programs are executing at the same time. So slices representing tasks from different programs can take turns being executed. So one program might execute tasks, then another program will execute a task, and so on and so forth. Now, when we're, when we're um, executing tasks in the CPU, we may have some exceptional events that occur. Uh, and these could trigger interrupts. Now, an interrupt is a signal to a processor emitted by hardware or software indicating an event that needs immediate attention. So there are a variety of ways this can happen. Um, and we'll go into some examples uh, right after this. Basically, what happens is the OS pauses the current action. So whatever the CPU is doing right now at this moment, it saves that any data, it saves that what's going on, or it saves any data related to what's going on in the CPU. And then it initiates a program called an interrupt handler to deal with the high priority event. 
Now this interrupt handler is part of the OS and um, basically it deals with this interrupt or this interrupt signal that has been sent to the CPU. Um, once the interrupt handler is done with is done executing the event that has uh, initiated the interrupt, then normal CPU operations resume according to what has been saved. Um, basically, there are two types of interrupts, hardware interrupts and software interrupts. So hardware initiated interrupts and software initiated interrupts. Some examples of hardware interrupts may be a printer paper jam, a keyboard pressed by the user, or a disk drive indicating is ready for more data. These will interrupt current operations and take some action based on whatever, whatever that particular event is. Some software interrupts may be a software error malfunction leading to a, an exception or something or the other. Or maybe another example might be an infinite loop in a computer program. So you're running an infinite loop and then the computer realizes what's happening and stops the program. Now the next process, which is kind of related to interrupts, is called polling. And polling is a process where one program or device repeatedly asks for the status of another. Um, so a great example would be um, if you are driving, or let's say that your parents were driving a car, and you want to know whether you're there, whether you're at your destination yet. And so you keep asking them over and over again, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? For the next, for the three hours, the entire journey. If that's what you're doing, you're effectively polling your parents. You're repeatedly asking for their status with regards to the journey. Now, in the context of a computer, if a computer is repeatedly checking whether your printer is connected, if it's sending a signal every five seconds, that's another example of polling. Or if the printer is doing the same thing and checking whether the computer is ready to connect every five seconds, that would be an example of polling. Now, a common alternative to polling is interrupts. So that means that rather than the computer or rather than the, rather than the printer uh, checking every five seconds, whether the computer is ready, whenever the printer wants to print something or conduct an action, it just sends an interrupt to the computer and that interrupts the CPU and just does whatever needs to be done. Or vice versa, the computer sends an interrupt to the printer, which also should have a processor. Uh, it stops current printing operations or whatever's going on and the printer executes a command. Now, these are some comparisons between interrupts and polling. Um, so an interrupt is triggered by an external event. A polling is an activity of sampling, so constantly checking the status. The interrupt can occur at any time. A polling occurs at regular intervals. Um, a polling is, generally, polling is generally much more wasteful because this is a constant action that's going on versus an interrupt only happens once. So an interrupt is just one signal sent once to the CPU, which then uh, conducts some action, versus the polling is constantly just querying the CPU and um, asking for status. And as a result, we can say that interrupts are generally while they could be inefficient because they're interrupting the CPU, they're more efficient than polling. Now, next we've got scheduling. We kind of talked about the scheduler before when we were, when we were referring to virtual memory. Um, scheduling is just kind of broadly the act of assigning tasks to resources. So this could be processors, network interface, graphics cards, etc. And this is scheduling tasks to be done, you know, one by one, like what order and when are these tasks going to be done? And that scheduling function is conducted by the operating system. Now, there may be some kind of algorithm that informs that scheduler or causes it to schedule things in a certain way. Um, and that will be determined by the operating system. Now, the goal of a scheduler is to keep all resources busy, allow users to share resources effectively, basically take turns, and basically to complete any computer tasks as quickly and efficiently as possible. It's basically to like optimize the operations of a computer and the CPU. We have some IB questions. Um, you can go ahead and click on the link to the slideshow in the description in order to see these IB questions um, with their mark schemes. Now, if you found value in this video, I would encourage you to like and subscribe to it. You can also check the description for links to my study guides for the SL exam, the HL exam, and for paper three, which also includes some sample papers with sample answers. Have a nice day.